The story of Australia's first peoples is the oldest continuing human story on Earth. This podcast series presents a collection of first people's voices, sharing their experiences, achievements, hopes and beliefs. These are the real stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia. Hi, I'm May Rasanta and you're listening to The Real Podcast Series. In this episode, I'm chatting with proud Torres Strait Islander woman and Sydney Roosters rugby league player, Talisha Harden. Hey, Talisha, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you. Now, I hear this is your very first podcast. It is, yeah, my, my podcast debut, so uh, looking forward to it. A bit nervous, but no, we'll be right. Debuts on podcasts is probably like debuts in footy, I'm imagining. Just those nerves are kicking in, ready to run on the field and give it your best. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, always a bit daunting doing something for the first time, but no, really excited. And you're very talented at doing things for the first time. Interesting reading up about your sporting history. It's not just in league, but you've played um, Union Sevens and also volleyball before that. So super talented, multiple sports, a lot like our mob who are, you know, athletes across, you know, lots of different sports. How did you end up deciding on playing league? Um, it was a bit of a long journey to, to get to league. I was a real gammon at sports kind of all through primary school um, and didn't kind of find a niche until I hit uh, probably 12, 13 years old with indoor volleyball. Um, and then, yeah, did that for a long time and, and then progressed into a bit of rugby union, rugby sevens. Um, and then, um, you know, coming from an Indigenous family, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family, you know, it's part of our culture. I think it's in, in bed in us to, to love rugby league. And I've always loved it um, since I was a kid and wanted to give it a go. Um, and then, yeah, just by chance, uh, met a lady who was putting a team in the Murray Carnival uh, back in 2013, played a game and, you know, the rest is history. I just loved it ever since. It's hard to believe that you would have been gammon at primary school. I bet you were pretty good. I'll have to ask some people around <laughs> you. Um, but just generally growing up around a lot of sport in the community or a, a, a family members who were kind of role models when you were younger. Yeah, probably my uh, my my nan. Um, she was always, you know, pretty influential on my life. But we, um, you know, I grew up in Logan, so um, it's the outside of Brisbane there and um, real big community, multicultural community, lots of different, um, you know, people. I, I had best mates who were, um, you know, Indigenous. I had best friends who were um, Filipino, Vietnamese, Samoan, Tongan. So, you know, we had a lot of fun growing up, just playing in the streets, really, um, kicking a footy around, throwing a ball. Um, we used to take down the, the fence in between myself and my neighbour's house, leave a bit up in the middle and play tennis um, in the summer over, over a little bit of fence. How so that? Yeah, yeah. So we just had, we just had fun. It sounds like a lot of our kind of um, childhoods, unfortunately not mine, sporty was not where I was at, <laughs> but um, grew up around a lot of talented sports people and just, you know, you make your own fun. You know, life is full of all of um, the good things. You don't need money, but there's plenty of um, activities to do and games to play and your imagination kind of runs wild. When you were a kid, what did you think you were going to do when you grew up? Oh, I had no idea. Um, I, I genuinely had no idea. You know, I think I just... I just wanted to be to be good at something, and I, you know, academically, I wasn't um, wasn't the the brightest kid, but I always worked hard. Um, and then, yeah, realised kind of year six, year seven that I really wanted to go to university. Uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but all I knew was I wanted to go. Um, so yeah, originally I wanted to be a vet, um, but then worked out pretty quickly that. I'm really emotional when it comes to animals and stuff like that too. So that wasn't a path I was going to go down. Um, but yeah, no, I, I never thought sport would be um, a pathway for me. Um, I always assumed it would be, you know, I'd, just, I'd go out and work or I'd, I'd do something, you know, didn't know what it was at the time. Um, my family's a big Defence Force family as well. So that was an option too, to jump into the Defence Force. Um, mum and dad were both in the, you know, involved in the Defence Force. Dad was in the army for years and years and years so yeah that was always an option too. So do you think the looking forward that you may not have thought of sport as a future career because of the time and being a woman in sport like I don't think women generally think you're going to be a professional because those paths weren't there as much as they are now. Yeah definitely I mean a lot of my role models growing up were all all male and you know I loved watching Preston Campbell and Maddie Bowen run around they were just too deadly and um, you know there weren't too many well, there were lots of female athletes at the time, but they weren't really, you know, portrayed in the media or, um, you know, it's hard to, I guess the saying, it's hard to be something if you can't see it. So, you know, a lot of a lot of young girls probably didn't think that that was achievable for them. So, um, yeah, but it's, it's shifted enormously in the last kind of four or five years. Um, you turn on the TV now and you can see women's sport, uh, you know, every day almost. So, um, and that's like with us now, you know, we start our NRLW season this Saturday. Um, so... 
yeah, it's, it's crazy how much it's developed. And how does it feel to be amongst that wave of, you know, women being professional sports people um, at a time like, to, like it is right now? Yeah, I guess it's a mixture of um, exciting but, but scary at the same time. You know, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. Um, we've got a responsibility to leave the game in a better shape than when we've, you know, we got it from the girls who, who came before us. They, they fought hard for the opportunities that we have today. And I know a lot of the playing group today are just so grateful that we, we got these opportunities and that they are um, coming about. And they wouldn't have happened without the girls who, who fought so hard for so long. You know, there's stories of girls having to, to sell their cars and, and take... Um, leave without pay for long periods of times, quit their job just to go and play play footy. And I'm sure it's the same across a, a whole range of other sports, you know, having to fundraise for, for women's teams to go away and things like that too. So, yeah, no, it's uh, it's exciting that it's that it's all happening. Um, and I know that we're, we're pumped, you know, we're ready to roll and um, it'll be fun. And, you know, there's lots of young girls now and young boys who, who can watch women, uh, women players on TV, which is really exciting too, the fact that young boys can actually see, you know, women on the on the TV. Yeah, super exciting. And so you, you're kicking off this Saturday. So, you know, pre-season, you've moved down from Brisbane. We won't talk about Queensland and New South Wales <laughs> in this interview. Um, but you're down in Sydney. Are you enjoying being here? And how are you feeling about, um, you know, get running on the field this Saturday and the new season? Yeah, loving Sydney. Um, we're living over in Coogee at the moment. So oh, it's, it's tough over there, you know, <laughs> being beachside. and No, but we're so grateful to to be able to be, you know, be here and loving it. Um, the weather's a bit cold. I'm uh, missing the Queensland heat a little bit, but um, no, just it's been awesome. The Sydney Rooster, Roosters are such an amazing club. They've been so, you know, inviting. The culture is amazing. Um, and I think just the way that they look after everyone within the club is something that I've, I've really enjoyed. You know, we've got, I think, six or seven um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander girls in, in our team. Um, our strength and conditioning coach, he's a Torres Strait Islander fellow. One of our, one of our coaches, our assistant coach, Adam, he's a, he's a Koori fella. So, you know, we've got a, a really good mix of cultures. Um, but in saying that too, we've just enjoyed each other's company, enjoyed working hard. And uh, we've got our first game against the New Zealand Warriors, yeah, Saturday in Melbourne, which will be a, a big game for us. Certainly sounds exciting. Um, it would be un- quite unusual to have such a um, high population of Indigenous people across a team like that at all kind of levels. So nice to hear. I bet that really influences the culture of a club and it was probably quite attractive in you coming down to join it. Yeah, definitely. Like I'd, I'd played with a, a few of the girls um, in the Indigenous All-Stars teams um, over the years and it, it definitely was, you know, a good chance to, to reconnect with some of those girls and it's always nice to play with, um, you know, girls with common journeys and and goals and stories and things like that and we always have a have a laugh and a yarn after and before training sometimes during training too but you know it's good because we just we just enjoy each other's company and in saying that too we've got a lot of girls um on the Sydney Roosters teams who are non-indigenous but they they love it they embrace culture and we're the same you know we've got lots of lots of girls in our team who are Tongan and Samoan and we're always asking about you know their family story and and things like that too. So it's a really good blend of, of culture and diversity. And yeah, I think it makes the team more united because we understand and we know each other's backgrounds and stories. Because that's often the success of a team on the field is how well it's set up behind the scenes and the business and the culture of the club organisation, you know, um, players and how they work together. And that just makes winning on the field so much easier. Um, how much do you love to win? Is that a big driving force in, um, you know, your training and your um, desire to play? Oh, absolutely. I think I, I come across as quite chilled and reserved and things like that, but uh, on the surface especially, but underneath I'm really, really competitive, like super, super, super competitive. I try not to let the exterior kind of, um, you know, know it and portray that and show that, but underneath I'm, I'm always wanting to, to win and to do better and to improve and to challenge myself. And I think that's part of the reason I made the move down from, from Brisbane was just to, you know, get out of my comfort zone completely. Um, new city, new team, um, you know, new challenges in itself, just just playing with different people who I wouldn't otherwise get to play with. Uh, Rick Stone as a coach who I've never been coached by before. So, you know, that was really attractive for me to come down here and just throw myself completely out of my comfort zone. And I loved my time with the Broncos last year, absolutely loved it. And like you said, we had, um, you know, the culture that really breeds success and that was what we had last year at the Bronx and I, I loved it. It was such an amazing uh, amazing team to be a part of but yeah for me this year 2019 was kind of a year where I thought oh let's just let's just challenge myself and um, I think that's the only way I'll, I, I would have improved was to throw myself completely in the deep end and hopefully I, I swim and don't sink but we'll find out soon. 
I'm sure you will because you're not only um, a fabulous player but also a great leader and you've captains, captained teams before um, and you know lead younger players and we can kind of already sense that in your person as well as soon as you kind of walked in here that kind of calm reassuring leadership kind of um, vibe that you give off is that um, has that always been with you have you always been a leader oh I'm not too sure I was I was um I was asked this the other day actually I um I don't think I I kind of knew or realized that maybe I did possess a, a few of these leadership qualities but I probably um, can put that down to just that family upbringing, that connection with culture, um, and how that shaped me. And you know, my parents were really hard workers. Like, like you said, we, you know, we did it, we did it pretty tough, but we always had that that really strong bond. And mum and dad instilled in me a real desire to always work hard. Things aren't going to be handed to you. Um, that you've got to work, work, work. And um, I think that's just something that was just inherent kind of within me because of them, because of my upbringing, um, which I'm so grateful for. You know, having to have to work hard for for absolutely everything but no I, I love it I love being you know there for some of the younger players I love being able to um, you know like I said reassure them and and kind of take them under my wing when they need it but also I think it's it's nice to learn from some of those younger players too because you you get a bit caught up sometimes in the day-to-day life and those young girls really reinvigorate you and and just teach you to appreciate every moment so it's a nice learning process from I think myself um, as a leader, but also I'm just continuously learning every day from people around me. And what does pre-season look like for those out there that don't know? I'd love to know. What, what is your lifestyle like at the moment? How do you prepare to, um, you know, run on the field for the season? Oh, it's a lot of running. It's a lot of running. There's <laughs> Literally running on yeah, the field. Yeah, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of running. Um, we've had a really big strength and conditioning focus. Um, so, yeah, it could be anything from, you know, a couple of Ks a session to lots of kilometers through the legs in a session um but because it's such a shortened season we've got a four-week pre-season so we've kind of got to cram everything into that four four weeks so um our, our staff are amazing in tailoring it to what we need to do and accomplish that that particular week but yeah a day could look like you know going to work um and then going to training maybe doing a bit of video review uh jumping onto the field doing a session for an hour and a half two hours heading straight over to the gym doing a gym session for an hour uh, maybe doing a bit of media or uh, catching up with the the coach for you know a quick chat or something like that. So it's kind of like a three and a half hour block of training in an afternoon, and we could be doing that three to four times a week at the moment. And yeah, it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Uh, it's a little you know it's a snapshot into what what the boys have to have to go through or the men have to go through every week. So no, we're enjoying it. And how are you feeling physically? Um, pretty good, pretty good. I, I had a kind of a horrific. Uh, ankle break a few years ago which was really tricky to to kind of overcome but since then I've been um struggling I think with my body but the last six six to twelve months has been really good and you know with all that data and stuff around sports science and recovery and how to take care of your body when I was a bit younger I used to just ignore it but now that I'm getting getting older and the body's getting a little bit more seasoned it's um yeah it's really important so no I'm feeling good feeling fresh and ready to go on Saturday um, share a little bit about me. Um, my husband's a former rugby player and he still is into the whole um, re- recouping and training consistently. So there's always stretching going on in the house, rolling, uh, armor tech, he's bought his own armor tech boots so that he can do those every day and guns for the... So I totally wow. understand like the recovery piece and he's not even a professional athlete anymore. So, it, But it does, the older you get, the more you want. And I'm just, I love it. I, I pop in the boots now too because you just feel better for it, don't you? You've got to take care of your body as you get older. Yeah, definitely. Like I... <laughs> I always used to laugh when people would be like, oh, you need to stretch or go and do some yoga or go and do Pilates. And, um, you know, as a kid, you think you're invincible and you can keep playing forever. But, yeah, now I'm in my mid-20s. I'm kind of like, oh, yep, no, this is this hurts. This is hard. Yeah, at mid-20s. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, it's getting there. Um, and overcoming injury, that's always very hard for athletes, um, not only physically but also mentally, just you're wondering if it's going to ever go again. How has that take us um, into how you felt at the time and what – kind of helped you get through that hard time yeah I was I was super gutted I was supposed to make my um Queensland Origin debut in 2015 um week before I thought oh, I'll just get a couple more uh minutes under my belt have a bit of a throw you know throw the footy around a little bit more and yeah went to score a try scored the try which was awesome but yeah broke broke dislocated just destroyed my ankle in the process um so short term it was just really gutting because I'd missed out on that that Origin debut it was really hard 
Uh, but then I, I kind of hadn't thought ahead to what the next nine to 12 months would look like after that. And it was just a range of rehab, hospital appointments, follow-up appointments. Um, so I was pretty down. I was pretty pretty anxious about it all too because you, you kind of hit your peak and you, you like I, I went from representing All-Stars to the, the Australian team to breaking my ankle two weeks later. So um, you always question yourself, your ability, if you're going to get back, what, what that looks like, if it's going to take you, you know, nine months, 12 months, 14 months before you're mentally prepared for everything as well and that's probably what happened to me is physically I felt good but mentally it took me probably till until the end of the 2016 season to to fully be in a game be present in a game but if I didn't have yeah like I said my, my family's been huge for me so yeah friends family got me through that entire process so yeah it's been a challenge but but back now and do you have big family I do I've got a huge family so I've got a bit of a mixed uh blended family so um dad's side of the family he's one of 11 so he's got he's got big family lots of cousins lots of um aunties and uncles and then mum's side of the family she's one of five um and then my mum's partner my dad as well mixed family um he's one of four as well so we've got big family on both sides so yeah no it's good um and I think everyone at some stage has just played a massive role in my life like even just being down here in Sydney I've had family call, family text, everyone wanting to know what's happening with games, what's happening with this. And all my family are, are pretty hard out Broncos supporters, uh, except for Daddy's a South supporter. So when I when I told them I was playing for the Roosters, they were all a bit... Uh, Nan was saying she was never going to be caught in a Roosters jersey, but I think I've, I think I've convinced her. She's, yeah, she's still not happy about it, but that's all right. That's the way... Um Nothing like having one of your own play. You're, you can switch teams or at least back that one player in that team, eh? Yeah, that's it. Nan, Nan literally texts me when the um, Roosters were playing the Panthers. She goes, I can't believe I'm sitting here cheering for the Roosters. She said, I never thought that would happen. So she's converted a little bit over into the men's side of the game too. And how long will you be in Sydney for? Uh, so nine weeks in total um, and we're week the start of week five now. So, yeah, about halfway through the journey. Uh, not too long left to go. Yeah. Um, and, and just building up at the same time. So are you feeling anxious? I am actually, yeah, I'm very nervous. You know, it's my, it's my debut in, in Roosters Colours, uh, which is something I'm really excited about. But at the same time, you know, very nervous about the club's got a really rich history and um, it's nice that the, the women are such a huge part of the club culture, you know, at the moment, which is awesome. So, yeah, just want to do the jersey and my family proud, but also just my teammates as well you know we work so hard the last four weeks especially it's been a it's been a really steep learning curve lots of training um so yeah I think that's probably why I'm putting a bit of pressure on myself because you know I've been given this this amazing opportunity um and I don't want to let anyone down but I'm sure we'll be you know I'm sure we'll be fine when win or lose hopefully win um but no it'll be a good game um and I'm sure you will um and I think the thing I see in you that I can see from conversations with my husband is just that sheer determination. Like we've got plenty of talented um, kids. It's just what takes you to that next level is that, you know, putting in the hard work day in, day out and having that strong mentality to, you know, to be the leader that you need to be on and off the field. So all the best for um, the games coming up and um, we look forward to watching and cheering you on. Um, can I just switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your speech pathology um, work that you've done? Um, are you doing that here or just is that mostly when you're up in Brizzy? Yeah, when I'm up in Brizzy, um, I'm a full-time speech pathologist. Um, it was just a bit tricky to try and get a, a, a locum position down here. But yeah, when I go back, um, I'll be working as a speech speechy and I, I love it. I'm really lucky to do what I what I do and um, work for a great organisation as well, the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health. So I get to work with our mob every day um, on the Gold Coast especially. But yeah, just being able to help people, help families with their communication needs, whether that be um, for a little two or three year old up to a, you know, a, an elder who's 60 or 70 who might have difficulties with swallowing or communication like just to know that we're we're there across the lifespan to help people communicate is something I really enjoy. Yeah I knew nothing about it I was interested to hear more about you know how you fell into that field and um, so you obviously you just said that it's from young to old but what are some of the signs that people might have that they might need someone like you to help? Yeah it kind of works in with with how I got into it as well so I, I had a lot of middle ear um, infection so lots of um, otitis media so my speech and language were really um, I guess 
uh, slow to develop, and and that's probably one of the big thing with our mob is that there's a lot of a um, lot of young young fellas who do get those recurrent ear infections, which can affect speech and language, and then later on literacy when they get to school, and then um, it's tricky too because the kids who might have had the ear infections and things like that because school's a bit trickier they get labeled as the the bad or the the naughty kid when, when realistically it might have come off the back of you know some ear difficulties and things like that but yeah just um we might do things with um yeah with kids who are a little bit um slower to develop some of those skills it might be because of hearing it might be um not because of hearing uh it could be older older um people who have been in car accidents who have had strokes who have had brain injuries who can't quite communicate the way they need to who might have swallowing difficulties too that's a big one it's a really big area for us is mm. um, people who can't manage their their food so they get pneumonia they get chest infections and yeah it's pretty pretty hectic but it's a really rewarding job to know that you can you can help someone pass through that that type of difficulty and and do what they want to do in everyday life and is that suffered more within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community um, compared to mainstream? Um, they say one in six people in, in general have speech or communication difficulties, um, but in, within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, it is a little bit higher, um, especially at that younger age, just because of all the, the recurrent ear infections. So that's something we work closely with. We work with the, the audiologists and paediatricians and, um, you know, all the specialists that we can to make sure that our little ones have the best chance at at succeeding whether that be you know just regular checkups it might be grommets it might be um some speech therapy it could be anything but yeah it's um it's a pretty prevalent um type thing in in aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people and so you like working um within the organization that you do and with um, our communities and helping health more broadly you must be a bit of a superstar not only you know able to help on the kind of um, speech pathology side of things but also seeing a you know professional athlete amongst the mix um how's it like being uh, how is it being at work every day and um you know interacting with the mob um, on a day-to-day basis oh i love it i love it and it's so funny too because um Sometimes I, I find it hard because, so, you know, a lot of families want to talk about footy, which is awesome and I love it. So it's nice to be able to connect with, um, with families over that. Oh, how'd you, how'd you, what did you think of the game on the weekend? Or how was that? Or what's happening with the girls game? So it's really nice that um, even though we might have a family there who's there to see me for um, speech pathology, that we can connect on that level through sport or through culture or something like that. Um, but no, I love it. Um, I'm really excited. And, and it's something I can connect with a lot of the kids with too because they've all... Oh, a lot of them love their footy. So, you know, we might tailor some of our therapy activities to be around footy and, you know, we might create a story around JT and him kicking this ball and then we can write about it and then we can make something, you know, footy related. So it's really nice how it ties in. And I think, um, yeah, being a speechy, but also being a footy player, they work quite well together. I didn't see that at first. I was like, oh, I'll try and keep the hats a bit separate and, you know, I'm a footy player at night and a speechy during the day but it's almost <laughs> it's too hard in, in community because everyone loves it at the same time um and it's all about kind of using your voice really um and you know owning your experiences and using that to influence positively those kind of people around you um how do you find um social media and u- utilizing kind of platforms to share some of the positive messages that you're um, you know, around health or um, footy or role modelling that you're currently doing? Yeah, I really, um, I've only kind of just got into the social media side of things. I'm a bit slower than a lot of um, a lot of the others just because, I don't know if it's because of my age or, you know, my technology is just, I've got no knowledge of technology. But no, it's great, especially um, I do a little bit of work with Deadly Choices um, up in Brisbane as well and they're, they're so good, you know. Um, they put recipes online about how to... Um, cook um you know deadly tucker and stuff like that and then make things healthier um there's a lot of health promotion and stuff around smoking cessation so um yeah just being able to access stuff like that online and being able to share it and promote it through my own social social media platforms is something i really enjoy doing um because it kind of resonates with with me as an individual um well it does resonate with me as an individual um trying to live a healthy lifestyle and um, just you know, encourage younger younger people to take control of their health and to make healthier choices, whether that be through um, eating or drinking or gambling, whatever it may be. It could just be going for you know a five minute walk in the morning to something a little bit more um, routine, like going to a gym once a week. It could be anything. So yeah, no, I think the power of social media is is huge um, with the the way the world's working at the moment too. We're in such a technological world and. 
um, I think that's where we can do a lot of the the good stuff and reach a lot more people through through social media. So I need to get better at it, but I'm but I'm definitely working on it. And in terms of diet and you know taking care of yourself, um, workshopping questions with the team <laughs> coming in, they want to know what your best cheat meal is. My best cheat meal. Oh, that's tricky. I um cheat meal i love tacos like i love tacos because i love sour cream and so i'll i'll have the healthiest looking taco and then i'll just dump some sour cream on it and some cheese just to make it that little bit more i don't know flavorsome and full but yeah i love love tacos i love a stir fry stir fry's good um what did i have the other night oh san choy bao yes. is always a goodie yeah yeah i love some san choy bao. carbs yeah yeah with a bit of a lettuce leaf there or i'll do um spaghetti um, with zucchini noodles instead of pasta Mm -hmm. it's always a favorite um but no i i usually eat pretty well so um yeah i don't mind a bit of a snack every now and again like a chocolate or a packet of chips but for the most part it's it's pretty healthy yeah no good and um what are you looking forward to um for the rest of the season coming up um i think probably like the on-field stuff is amazing and you know we'd love to win the premiership that's probably the big goal but I think just to see how much it impacts the broader community um, is something I'm really looking forward to. We had a lot of people jump on on board with the the women's game, especially last year, the women's movement, NRLW, like it was huge. But to actually have girls there, boys there, you know, middle-aged men and women there know who we are as a group and, and really recognise what we're trying to do. And, you know, you, oh, you inspired my daughter. I can't wait for my nieces to start playing footy. Oh my gosh! I'm I'm now coaching a little women, a uh, little girls, footy team. Like just little things like that just make the whole process so worth it. Um, so yeah, probably that social impact amongst communities is something I'm really looking forward to seeing and and how that how that grows. It's going to be massive in a few years. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's just kind of the start, isn't it? You can you're part of that kind of growth and helping that move along. How many years do you think you have in you? Oh, I don't think I'll play past thirty. So that gives me three or four more years. Four at max, I think. Four, I think by thirty, I'll be I'll be done. You know, there's so many awesome women still running around in their mid thirties playing, killing it, absolutely killing it. But I know I don't think my body will let me go go that long. It's endured a bit of a bit of I don't know trauma the last ten years or so. So yeah, and um, that's a good goal. And then so you're only thirty at that point. What's going to be next? So still continue to be a speechy. Is there travel in the future? What other goals do you have outside of footy? Well, my best mate, uh, Taliqua Clancy, she's a beach volleyballer. She's a proud Aboriginal um, woman as well. Um, I think I'll go over and fangirl with her a little bit because she'll be playing, fingers crossed, in the Tokyo Olympics next year. So I went and watched her in Rio three years ago, um, but they're a real big medal chance next year. And I think she'll probably play the four years after that too. So yeah, I think I'll just follow her around the beach volleyball circuit for a while and um, hopefully she can win, a, win an Olympic medal. But other than that, yeah, just a bit of travel, um, maybe a couple of kids. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> Wait good. and see. Yeah, family in amongst it. So, can you tell us what you think is unique about being an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person today? Oh, I think just that that inherent spiritual connection that we all have amongst each other. Um, it's something you can't describe. It's something that you can't see, but it's something you can feel. Um, and I think that's why across different communities across different clans and mobs and things like that we've all just I feel like we've got this shared understanding this shared love this shared appreciation for our culture um you know we're resilient people we're proud people um and even though we don't necessarily go over the top and promote that and and shout it from the rooftops we all feel it um and that's something that I love I love that I can feel that um something that I really really enjoy even an example is we've got um, a young girl on our roosters team uh, named Bobby and I saw her from across and I'd never met her before and I thought I'm pretty sure she's Aboriginal and a couple of the girls who have played all season with her were like no she's not Aboriginal she's not Aboriginal I walked up to her and I said Bobby are you Aboriginal she's like yeah I am and I was like oh my gosh you know you can just feel that connection to people so yeah that's something I love. So you would have had exposure to lots of fabulous coaches, mentors during your time, um, both in professional sport and other areas. Has there been any um, pieces of advice that have stuck out to you and that have stayed with you over time that have really kind of served you well? Yeah, I um, I had 
oh, like you said, I've had a, a lot of um, awesome coaches, people involved in um, in my sporting journey so far. But I think a big one for me has been my uh, my Burley coach, Tani Norris. So she saw me, you know, break my ankle, go from all these highs and lows of of sport basically in 18 months to she helped pick up the pieces when I was really struggling um, and whatnot. But she basically just, it wasn't so much what she said, it was just that she instilled, I guess, an inner belief in me that I could get back and that I could be pushed. She broke her neck playing for Australia. So um, she was someone I could lean on quite well. Um, you know, breaking your neck is, is something huge. And I had this ankle and I thought, gosh, I, that doesn't even compare. So she almost was that person who, who got me back without even knowing it. Like if she can walk, talk, still run, you know, a three-kilometre time trial faster than me, if she can do all that having had a broken neck, you know, my ankle's a tiny drop in the water compared to that. So, yeah, that was more an actions type thing. But for her as a coach, she's a, she's a, a woman coach obviously and um, she's been through it all. So, yeah, I think for her it was – just she's just always instilled that belief in me and she's always treated me as an equal and always treated me as a as a a person first and a footy player second so that's something I've always probably resonated with sounds like a great coach I've lived in the states before and they they literally look at us and go how crazy are you being so um physical in your game so what do you say to people um when they ask you and you know what do you do for a living and you're a professional you know rugby league player what do they say Usually their first reaction is, oh, you play rugby, that's cool, but like you guys don't tackle, do you? And I'm like, no, 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 we, we tackle, there's shoulder on body contact and there are big hits. Oh, okay, but it's not like, it's not full on tackle, is it? I was like, well, no, there, there's kind of only, you know, there's only tackle or non-tackle. There's no in between, like you're either hitting people or you're not. So, um, yeah, I think it takes a lot of people some time to get their head around that but then when they see a game they're like oh my gosh that was so physical that was so brutal and they don't expect it coming from I guess women in that sense but um no it's amazing it's such a such a fun part of the game it's a huge part of the game so it's nice to kind of see people's perceptions of the game turn at that stage they go oh wow that's that's amazing you guys are just as physical as as the men are and gaining more and more kind of supporters as you go yeah, definitely. And, and it's awesome too because there are little girls, four, five, six years old, learning how to tackle, which is amazing too. Um, and they're playing in the same team as boys up until a certain age, but they're tackling. And I've seen some amazing young girls out there. Like I think there was a, um, a photo a while ago of Maddie Bowen's daughter and she was tackling um, you know, a kid who was probably three times her size, a, a, a boy as well. And um, that's going to become normal. Like That's going to be a normal thing in a few years where girls and, and boys are just playing together, playing contact sport together. Um, in the media at the moment, there's a lot of talk about kind of racism with, you know, the Adam Goods couple of films that have kind of come out and just racism more broadly. Have you ever come across that on the field um, or playing? Um, I've, been, I've been pretty lucky to not experience it um, directly on the field. Um, but there have been instances in my life where I feel as if people have assumed because of whatever they've learned or heard or grown up with and in their mindset they've assumed that I can't have achieved something so I'll often get a comment like oh what do you do for work like where where do you work oh actually I'm a I'm a speech pathologist oh so you did you have to go to uni for that or can you you know what do you have to do and it's just like there's this assumption that um because I'm young because I'm a black fella because there's this and this that I can't have achieved what I wanted to achieve and, and I'm not too sure what that kind of speaks to but yeah I feel as if there is this perception that black fellas can't achieve or they can't do something um, significant and it doesn't even have to be significant I just there's just yeah I feel like there's just un- this this perception that's really it really irritates me in a way yeah and it's really subtle isn't it and it's it just really kind subtle. of underlying it's just it just pops up out of nowhere um, yeah because it'll it'll always come after the oh so what's your name what's your cultural background and it's like as soon as I've made maybe a, a comment about, oh, you know, I'm Torres Strait Islander or I'm Indigenous, that maybe the perception without even the person realising has shifted slightly and there's this assumption that what comes next isn't necessarily as, as good as what maybe is in their mind. I don't know if that makes sense, but, yeah. yeah I think it does make sense. Yeah. And for the, all the Aboriginal people out there and Torres Strait Islander people, you, that's, 
those set questions usually come in that order. We've yeah. all kind of had that conversation really and heard, yeah, name, usually in a taxi for me. Hi, what's your name? Where are you from? And then the assumptions that kind of kick in from that point. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely making sense. And that's been something I think it's really hard. But now, now I own that. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm Tosh Islander. Yeah, I, I play sport. I've, I've, I come from a proud family, you know, I, this and that. And I'm, I can be successful, you know, and it's, yeah, I love that our mob are changing that stereotype, changing that mindset of people. And, you know, we're, like I said, we're a proud, resilient people and we've got so much to show for it. And yeah, I can't wait until, you know, racism is, is gone. It's obliterated. It's not, it's not here anymore. And hopefully that's not too far off, but there's a lot of work to do. Yep, couldn't have said it better myself. Um, and talking about kind of other young people um, around, the what, what advice would you give to um, our young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids out there? Oh, all kids, but particularly our kids who might be listening in and looking up to you as an amazing role model. Um, what can they do to set themselves up for a successful life? I think something that that probably I'm I'm living at the moment is just to just to get outside your comfort zone and don't limit yourself to 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 things that you think you can achieve because if you don't put yourself outside those barriers you never know what you could you know potentially achieve so that's probably something is I think is um as mob we're often very very humble and very um we're very just cruisy um but I think there's so much so much more we we can we can achieve if we just allow ourselves to get outside those comfort zones that's something I had um, a chat with a couple of the younger girls, you know, oh, I don't think I should do that or maybe I'm not good enough to do that. And it's like, nah, sis, go, you know, go and give it a go, see what happens, challenge yourself. And um, yeah, I think that's something that I love to see is when people or when our mob do challenge themselves and they, oh man, they succeed, they're so good. And I think that's just something that's, yeah, I really enjoy. Yep, don't let that doubt creep in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for not letting your doubt creep in and continuing to challenge yourself and tread new ground, whether it's in speech pathology or role model or playing footy. Um, we're really proud to have had a chat with you today and wish you all the very, very best um, with the season this year and what whatever you do beyond that. And hopefully we'll um, get to see you at the Olympics cheering on in the background for your mate and see how we go from there. That'll but- no, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I'll definitely be there. we waving that flag around. So, yeah, that'll be me. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. You've been listening to The Real podcast series. The Real is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander digital media platform produced by 33 Creative. This episode was recorded in Sydney on Gadigal Country. Produced by Jake Keane and Marguerite Barbara. Music production by Jimbler. For more stories and podcasts, visit the-real.com.au forward slash podcast.